Yes. Picture this. Grade 8, 12-year-old me in school. <coughs> Turned up that morning to school and I went to my English teacher and I said to him, Sir, let's just call him Mr. X for this TEDx presentation. I said to him, Sir, I didn't do my homework last night because I didn't understand it. Is it okay if you help me a little bit with my homework before I get to class? He said to me, look, Angie, go to class and I'll help you when I get there. I turned up to class, I unpacked my bags and I sat in my normal seat. I sat down and prepared myself for that English lesson. Open your books, he says, to chapter 18. Take out your questions from questions one to five and let's see who answered them today in class. He pointed around the room and he stopped at me. Angie, he says, stand up. Tell the class your answers to questions one to five. Let them know your answers from last night. I said to him, but sir, I spoke to you this morning and I told you that I didn't answer my questions. I didn't understand. He weaved through the desks in the classroom and he came closer to my desk and banged his hand on the table and said to me, is that because your father's a bloody Arab? Is that because your father can't read English? I was shocked. My heart was racing. I didn't know what to do. I felt lost. I stood up in that class that day. I collected my books. I packed my bag and I left the classroom. I went straight to the principal's office and I demanded to see my father. I was in tears. Dad turned up soon after that. And he said to me, Angie, tell me your story. What happened? In front of the principal, let me know what happened. And I told him my story. And he said, OK, sit outside and wait for me. So I sat outside and I waited for Dad and I could hear his voice blastering through the plaster walls. I'll break his neck. I'll report him to the Ministry of Education. I'll take him to a current affair. It was the most difficult time of my childhood. It was challenging, it ripped my heart to pieces and I had a huge sense of disconnection. Mr X was asked to leave the school. He never returned. I soon became the school hero. <laughs> It was my first experience of cultural dislocation, the idea of them and us. However, it was going to be my fuel to understand my Arab culture and my Arab identity and what it was to be an Arab. My search for questioning Arabism versus Australianism and this identity of this so-called multicultural Australia. I was born in Sydney to a father who migrated to Australia at the age of 18 years old. He turned up to Australia studied at the University of Technology in Sydney and made a major career for himself in engineering. And to a Lebanese-Australian mother whose great-great-great-grandfather was the first Lebanese man to step foot in Australia. This incident led my dad to make a decision. He made a decision to take us to Lebanon for three months. Was there a reason? Yes. He wanted us to understand what it was to be Australian Lebanese or if there was anything that was called Australian Lebanese. I spent three months in Lebanon. I learned how to dance. I learned how to speak Arabic. I learned how to swear in Arabic. I learned how to run through the village streets. I learned how to climb trees. And I learned how to escape rocket grenades. <laughs> My experiences were rich. They were fulfilling. Okay, I made connections with family, with village people. I learnt where my father came from. I understood the human connections and that sense of belonging and that sense of love, security and cultural love that he had. So what do you assume happened then? We lived happily ever after. I understood my Lebanese background, my Australian background. I returned to Australia and everything was okay and that's it for the TED talk. No, that's not what happened. I returned back to Australia after leaving Lebanon with such rich experiences. I became the year 12 school captain of my school. I became the leader of the student leadership council for four years and I changed schools. This school was a more multicultural school. There were Vietnamese people there, Chinese people, Lebanese people, Italian people, Greek people, it was a multicultural school. 
at lunch times we'd make tabbouleh in the middle of the playground and my father would pass us greasy hamburgers through the wire gates. It was a multicultural school. My stomach was happy, so I was happy. <laughs> at the age of 15, I was asked to make a decision with my life, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Year 12 graduation, I got into law school. I came home super excited that day. Baba, Baba, I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to fight for the justice of people. Angie, go upstairs, go to sleep. We'll talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> the next morning, I came downstairs and I had coffee with my dad. He sat down and looked me in the eyes and he said to me, Angie, is this really who you are? Is this really who you want to be? Do you really want to fight for the justice or injustice for guilty or non-guilty people for the rest of your life? Do you really want to sit in court all day and organise people's files? <laughs> if this is going to make you happy, he said to me, then I'm OK with that. But I want you to be happy, he said. I want you to be content with your life. You can do whatever you want to do, Angie. You know, if you want to be a garbage collector, Angie, be a garbage collector. I'll be happy with that as long as you're happy. A garbage collector? What was he talking about? He continued. He looked at me in the eyes and he said to me, is law really what you want to do for the rest of your life? Is this going to make you roll out of bed or jump out of bed in the morning? All of these questions. Is this really who you want to be? Profound words of advice. Who I want to be? He made me think. Four years later, after that conversation, I graduated from university as a visual arts educator. I saturated... <laughs> I saturated myself into the two true loves that I had, art and education. My projects as an artist deal with concepts of boundaries, restrictions, confinement and transparency. Digging deep into my understanding, my identity was in transition. I began to answer my own questions and question my own questions. This dislocated, dysfunctional elements of my self-being began to emerge. Can I have my jacket? <laughs> That's the visual artist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is okay. All right. <laughs> wow. <Woo>! Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Art is where I can totally be true to me. As an artist, I continue digging deep deep into the questions of life and existence and what this all meant and the true meaning of life. I began to cultivate, cultivate my self-identity, which I knew was in transition. I began to collect the dislocated pieces and put them together. I began peeling off the born attachments. My perception of place and space, a sense formed by transparent meaning, layer upon layer, experience after experience. The journey was difficult and for some of you, you might never have attempted this, or even in fear of attempting this because of rejection or being ridiculed. I'll tell you what, from experience, it hurts. It's ambiguous, it's lonely, it's hard, but it's rewarding. I went from the exterior visualization and identification of who I was to the self-actualization through my process of art. If I was to have this conversation with my late grandfather, or if he was sitting in the audience today, he would have lifted his bushy grey eyebrows in total disapproval of what I was saying. His nationalistic connections with his hometown in Lebanon and his home village in Lebanon were embedded into his every heartbeat and his every breath. And for some of you in the audience, perhaps you're thinking the same thing, but hear me out. Culture is what you collect and carry with you from a, from a range of experiences and the journey in life. Cultivated identity is the living and breathing experience. It is nurtured and developed day by day. Transitional cultural identity is identity created with highly transitional world in which we live. I believe culture is where you find yourself, where you connect and where you find yourself most content in a particular time in your life. You see, deconstructing and reconstructing, this whole concept of ripping and reconstructing is paramount to the idea of self-actualization. 
Being born into a predetermined culture can be detrimental to creative innovation. Culture is grounded in experience of the moment. You have the choice to either reject it or accept it. Culture is the sensation of the senses and art is the process of doing this. I believe culture is no longer defined by place, by space, by time, by land or by religion. Yet, an identity across multiple experiences at different times of your lifetime. I rip and reconstruct almost everything in my life. I rip and reconstruct my identity, my art, the way I cook, the way I design my house. The only thing I haven't rip and reconstructed is my husband who sits here in the audience who's quite perfect for me. <laughs> <laughs> Where is he? Where is he, your husband? He's there. St stand up. Stand up, my man. All right. I make and create me, a unique me, every day. I am asking you to strip yourself of who you believe you are and authentically create yourself from the inside out. Not for what other people want you to be, but for who you need to be and who you want to be. I'm asking you to rethink what you think. I'm asking you to reformat the embedded subconscious habits <coughs> of life that make you a product of a conformed culture. Why be a product of this culture or this world when you can be unique? Who are you without the rules, the obligations and the categories? I challenge you to consider all of these ideas. How do you identify when stripped of your nationality your religion, your name, and your job. How do you identify? Traditional cultures are now fragments infiltrated by exterior extreme factors. We are humans in transition. Nowadays, a simplistic, superficial perception of self-awareness is an image on Instagram or a tantalizing taste of a few seconds through Snapchat. Look at me, look at my life, it's perfect. No more is the moment precious where experience is a sensual pleasure. Instead, our lives are based through lenses. Increase social pressure to be what everyone else wants you to be, except for you. This leads me to the question and the deep notion of what it all means. How do we identify as humans if we don't even know ourselves, yet seem to know everything about everyone else? It's a question I ask you all. Every day we learn more and more about knowledge, about other people's lives. But if I was to ask you to write an essay about yourself, how hard would that be? With not using your name, your religion or your nationality. What is your pure, genuine, unique existence among the 6.9 billion people we share the earth with? I took the road less travelled. I questioned conformity. I made internal choices that influenced my exterior perception of life, not the other way around. I am me, a unique soul, travelling through this place we call Earth, in preparation perhaps for another journey in another lifetime. I want to be the best soul I can possibly be. And that's why I constantly rip and reconstruct myself. However, I cannot find myself neither there or here or anywhere except within myself. Personally, I am no more or no less of one culture than another. My art students tell me that I'm a pretty good teacher at school. And I have three values that I've instilled for the past 18 years within my students. And those three values are respect, love and self-awareness. These fundamental values are essential in building long-lasting connections with my students. As an educator, it is my responsibility to open doors closed by habit and to fuel a generation bombarded with visual imagery, information data and constantly being banged to answer to social media and to conform. Through my art lesson, it is my responsibility to encourage them to etch into their own souls, to make sense out of nonsense and perceive with unfiltered perspectives and to be true to themselves. In the 55 minutes of my art class, it's the most challenging and powerful class where we, ha where we have a rigorous lesson. Question we, un we question the unquestionable and answer with deep, critical, analytical thought. Art is the tool used for tactile self-excavation. 
art education, creation and innovation is the intellectual process of, of self-identification. Art education allows students to be released from confined boundaries and step outside of their comfort zones. There's no wrong or right answer. There's no formulas. Only an experience to express and explore uniquely through artistic processes and unraveling the meaning through art creation. Curiosity is generated and expressed through concepts into visual bodies of works. My students create their own unique identity. Art class is the only class where anyone really cares of what you think. Two weeks ago, my colleague and I, Mr. Bryn Bernard, had the opportunity of meeting the world-renowned Kuwaiti artist, Mr. Sami Mohammed. We sat down with Sami Mohammed and spoke to him about his uh, uh, process of art and his bodies of works that he's created. And I said to him at the end of our conversation, I said, Sami Mohammed, what advice would you like me to take back to my students? He said to me, Angie, tell them to be true to themselves. Wow. My students in my art class are true to themselves. They are not cookies on a conveyor belt. They are non-conformists. They are molded into the unexpected. They dive into unknown waters and take risks to discover themselves. It is the only class where students' ideas and concepts can be projected into visual expressions of their bursting minds. They exit my art class not recognising themselves as they entered. So, why is this practised in family, in classes, in businesses and all institutions? Self-actualisation leading to increased productivity, leading to increased creativity. Making wholesome, unique contributions to the world. There are many initiatives on the importance of stimulating the creative mind. One of the latest articles that I've read by, read by Mr. Michael Keane focuses on being uh, implemented uh, this creative idea in the Asian industry and Asian business districts. And it's called the Special Creative Zones. And what that means is that they have these sections in, in businesses and firms and educational institutions where there is this fusion of an urban landscape, creativity, consumption, the idea and the sense of culture, and the, the best part about it is the coffee. It sounds like utopia. I know that Apple is often used as an example over and over again. However, their success is due to the emotional connections that they create. They grab your senses, they open your heart, you become addicted to the idea, you then purchase their idea and their products, and they work from the inside out. Audience, I challenge you today to broadcast your sense of creativity, reflecting fresh, unconventional journeys in this life. Instead of rolling out of bed every morning, jump out of bed every morning, excited to create a new you. If there is something that you take away with you today from this talk, for all the bank managers, business consultants, students, mothers, fathers, engineers, doctors, I leave you with the thought of practicing self-awareness and allowing yourselves to blossom through authentic awareness of who you are. My constant advice to my students for the past 18 years, and I'll pass this on to you today, is don't be afraid to be true to yourselves, whatever it takes. Be you. Be unique. I am true to myself through my artistic process, that quiet time of internal conversation with me and my art, working from the inside out and breaking down the fear of external perception. Don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone and challenge who you really are. Being fearless means being true to yourself. We are all born humans. However, we have the choice to make ourselves individual unique individuals. I leave you today with a small task. I'd like you to take out your phones. Now, now. <laughs> she has the mic, so... <laughs> and I'd like you to... You can hashtag this if you want, uh, TEDxDesman, or uh, I am TEDxDesman, but I'd like you just to go today to your notes. And I'd like you to open your notes for me, and I'd like you to start a sentence for me that starts, I am and finish that sentence without using your name, your religion, your job, or your nationality. 
Thank you.